today, and I, I was going to say next month, and then I realized how silly it was to say next month, uh, simply because I'm going to be gone half the next month. So, uh, but I was going to um, maybe do for the month, and I'll do it the month after, uh, the Gateless Gate. And we have a number of copies of this in the library if you're inclined to cause yourself a headache. And uh, I always try to do a little explanation of what koans are about or public cases. And the way they've typically been used is to wrench people away from their way of thinking. And uh, it's never an issue of faith, okay? And it's not an issue of historicity. It's an issue of no matter how you look at something, you're going to see something different than somebody else sees. And that's just a basic scientific fact that everyone in this room sees their own version of reality. So how do we come free of that? Well, the great Zen masters, as they were uh, teaching their students, uh, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path was pretty easy. Okay, we're, uh, by the way, we're returning to the basics. If you want to come to monks class, we've decided that everybody needs a good, solid review. And so we will be, uh, we're going to give up on the Parinirvana Sutra until next year. And we're just going to review some basic concepts in there and make sure everybody's comfortable with them. Well, I guess the Christians would say you have to be born again. Okay, because you can you can look at read something and go, oh, oh yeah, okay, this is wonderful. Yeah, this is gonna happen. You know, the the end of the world's gonna come and there's gonna be seas and rivers of blood and all that other wonderful stuff that's in there. And uh, but it doesn't really affect you until you accept it in your gut. And and then hopefully uh, you can keep it in your gut. Uh, my experience with the religions that are based on emotion is, is that you have to go every once in a while to get emotional again. And, and I hate to admit it, but there's been a couple people that came here and they really weren't coming for the half hour of meditation we do before the talk. They were coming for the talk to kind of recharge their battery. And that's okay, as long as it isn't too much of an emotional recharge, because you need to have some of your own energy going into it. So I talk about this because when we get together, uh, it's really encouragement. I was talking with a monk yesterday who informed me that he was very discouraged with the Vietnamese form of, of Buddhism, the way it was practiced. And I went, oh, really? Why is that? And he said, well, they're really not practicing missionary purposes. We're talking about the Vietnamese temples in America. And I went, yeah. He says, they're just creating a warm, comfortable place to be. And I thought to myself, isn't that what a temple's supposed to be? A warm, comfortable place to be? Matter of fact, isn't that what all churches should be? Is a warm, safe, comfortable place to be? And I thought, what is wrong with you? And I said, I said, well, I don't know about that, but this whole missionary business, we don't do that. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, not the re we're one of the few religions that doesn't go around trying to convince people to believe what we believe. And uh, he just let that drop right there. But I've never heard anything like that before. I'm discouraged with what's going on because you're not missionary enough. A Zen center, even though it doesn't look like it at times, is a warm, comfortable place to be. And it's, it is because, you know, sometimes I get a little uh, abrupt with people, hopefully for the right reason and not because I have a great personality flaw, which I do, by the way. To, want, to create a warm, comfortable place to be is to have a Zendo, to have a space that's dedicated just to the meditation, to have a place... People very often ask, can, can we come out anytime? And I go, yeah, you can come out anytime. Doesn't mean I'm going to be here, <laughs> but you're welcome to come out anytime. We practice together because we encourage each other. We go to the temple, and, I, and again, this is one of the great misconceptions, I guess, that many people have, 
is that uh, Zen centers and temples, and I and we do that in America. We talk about Zen centers. I always talk about a temple. You ever notice that? I always say temple <coughs> is a place you can go and have a cup of tea. <coughs> Zen center is a place you go to practice, and then it's time to leave. But and I I first lived at a temple that was a Zen center because we gave you one cup of tea that was about that big. A little tiny cup of tea and you better stretch it because you're not going to get offered a second cup of tea because that was the timer there. Remember the old timer you flip over to boil eggs? Well, that was the timer. When you were done with the tea, everything was over with. So the, the issue, I think most people in here are familiar with the Four Noble Truths. So, so I don't have to repeat them, but they're about, they're about suffering. They're about unhappiness. And this is for the people who will watch this in case, of course, they can go get their Buddhist dictionary and look up the Four Noble Truths. Uh, or probably an American dictionary and look up the Four Noble Truths. And, and then the Buddha had the Eightfold Path. Well, that's, that was the cause of my conversion to Buddhism. I probably just made a big sound, didn't I, Rob? Yes, sir. Put my hand on that. <laughs> uh, was reading the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And boy, did I convert. I gave up everything I believed and had a sleepless night. And the next day when I got up, I was a Buddhist of sorts. That didn't mean that I really knew any of this stuff. It just meant that I believed what I heard. I was sort of like a Christian Buddhist in the sense that I had emotionally got very charged with the idea that the world was full of unhappiness. And uh, there was a way out of that unhappiness. Now, how do we make that happen? There's a number of ways you can make it happen, but the most direct way you can make it happen is to give up everything you believe, including Buddhism. Just give it up. And then you won't be in conflict. You won't worry about somebody shaking your faith. You won't worry about a whole variety of things. The old Zen masters saw that they had students that had a great deal of faith, but they didn't have any doubt. And Nagachita, by the way, a little message from Nagachita for those of you who've been wondering where he's been at. He had his knee replaced last week. He called me for the first time in over a year and sounded like his old self, Tick Tom Way. And so he's in therapy now, physical therapy. And he's sounding really, really good. And I just thought I'd let you know that. And hey, we might even see him again one of these days. But he used to like to talk about great faith, and great doubt, and great effort. And he called that the three pillars of Zen. Well, uh, Philip Kaplow, when he wrote his seminal work, that's not his three pillars of Zen. Yet teaching was one of them, practice was the other. Wanji, do you remember what the third one was? I, I'm never good at remembering these things. I got two of them. That's, that's two more than I normally would get. But he would talk about the practice of meditation in reference to Buddhism, that we had to have great faith. Well, what do we have great faith in? We have great faith in the fact that the Buddha was awakened. Matter of fact, that's the only thing Buddhists have to have faith in. Some Buddhists have faith, faith in the idea that the Buddha will help them. And sometimes they pray to a statue so the Buddha will help them. And that's only because they're confused. See, we have three new people here who I may be <clears throat> saying something or going, what's he talking about? Well, see, you forgot. Look at that guy sitting over next to you. That's Buddha. And is this your son in front? Yes. That's Buddha. And if he looks around and sees mom, that's Buddha. Matter of fact, this whole room is full of Buddha. So when you pray for the Buddha to help, you pray for every sentient being that exists in the universe to help. And if you remember that, everything's fine. If you expect something magic to happen, nothing happens without hard work. And it certainly doesn't happen in Zen without hard work. So we have to have faith that the Buddha was enlightened. And if the Buddha was enlightened, then he did not lie. And he told us that all of us have Buddha nature and all of us can wake up. That's what the whole Lotus Sutra is about. It's the fact that all of us really are baby Buddhas who just haven't opened our eyes yet. 
And then we have to have zeal. We have to have this effort, which means that we don't give up. And when we get depressed or we get discouraged, we just don't give up. We're driven by this belief that if we, if we keep making the effort, we will realize that we're Buddha. Sometimes it's said, realize our Buddha nature. The, the chant we did earlier has that kind of thought. I don't like that kind of thought. There's nothing to realize. It's just we have to open our eyes and see it. It's kind of like the guy walking in the dark, and just before he runs into the wall, he sees it, bam! Okay, that's <clears throat> becoming awake. Because that wall was always there, and our, our Buddha nature is always here, and we know everything we need to know. All we have to do is open our eyes to it. And then we have doubt. And koans, this is one collection of Zen stories, Zen riddles. And this is the gateless gate. And it has, I never can read. You know, I'm just so good at remembering numbers. 48. 48, that's what I was going to say. That's 48. But I thought I'd flip through here and see a 49 popped up. It has 48 of some of the best Zen stories and problems in it. And these problems are to create doubt. And it's axiomatic. The great master, Lin Chi, said that if you give me a farmer, I can, I can push him until he becomes awakened. Because, of course, Zen masters don't give anything to anybody. Say, I, I, if I could give you something, I, I, I would pick Susan over here. She's so close as it is. And just say, here, now you're awake. And kapoof, magic would happen. But Susan has to do all the work, which she works very hard at becoming awake, at opening her eyes and seeing her Buddha nature. All I can do is encourage her. But every once in a while, she might get confused. And she might stop believing in herself. Well, that's my job to encourage her. And she might stop believing in the Buddha. And that's my job to encourage her. It's just like in the original Venia. My, my favorite rules for monks and masters is that the monk, master is to encourage a novice monk whenever he becomes discouraged not to quit. To keep encouraging that novice monk to continue on. And the novice monk is adjoined to keep encouraging the master to not quit and keep moving on. And that's what Buddhism is. We encourage each other all the time. So this is an encouragement. And we have little, little paradoxical problems in here that will pull us away from the way we think things are. Because no matter how intelligent we are or how educated we are, we still have the flaw of seeing things as we see them. And, you know, I like Rob a lot, but I can't see things the way he sees them. I can think I see it, particularly when he's wrong. I think I see what he's seen, but I don't. He has a different <clears throat> perception than my perception. So these little problems, these were problems that teachers use to help their students let go of what they believed about the reality. So, and this, I always love this. I don't know why, they, they write, I, I'm going to complain now. I don't know why in the Zen literature, if a Japanese teacher has written a book, he doesn't put in parentheses the Chinese name of the Chinese master he's talking about. Okay, and I only know one. This is Joshu, which is Chao Chu. And Chao Chu is very important to me. Because on the day that I was made a big shot, a Roshi came over to me and predicted that I would live the same number of years that Chao Chu lived. This is good for you. It's also good for Bui Mong. He has lots of time to get ready because Chao Chu lived to be 120. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a lot of encouragement. Now, I don't know if she was right or not, but that's what she said. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I maybe have enough time to get the work done. So we, these are called cases, and the whole name is a public case. And Chao Chu, or Joshu, as the Japanese call him, earnestly asked Nansen, what is the way? That's what we're talking about. What is the way? Am I stepping off the path and getting confused? Or am I still struggling along that same path to realize my true nature? And Nansen answered, the ordinary mind is the way. 
Joshua asked, should I direct myself towards it or not? Nansen said, if you try to turn towards it, you go against it. Joshua asked, if I do not try to turn toward it, how can I know that it is the way? Nansen answered, the way does not belong to knowing or not knowing. Knowing is delusion, not knowing is blank consciousness. When you have really reached the true way beyond all doubt, you will find it is as vast and boundless as outer space. How can it be talked about on a level of right and wrong? At these words, Joshu was suddenly enlightened. So this is probably the most direct riddle that a Zen student could be given. So what does that mean? It means stop thinking. That's all it means. Stop thinking. When you think of the last time you went out to eat. I went and had Mexican food last night. I had Vietnamese food for lunch. When I ate my Vietnamese food, I was so happy because it was everything I wanted to eat. When I had my Mexican food, it was so good. It was just right. But I didn't think that at the time. I just ate it and enjoyed it. That's the way. The moment I decide that it's overcooked, it's undercooked, it's not quite what I wanted, I, I get into trouble. The moment I decide that it's perfect and nobody could ever cook it any better, I get into trouble. The minute I decide that you're a pretty good guy but you still have some flaws to work on, I'm in trouble. And the moment I think that you have everything perfect, I'm in trouble. And all that applies to me. The, the greatest delusion are Zen masters who think they're done. We're never done. And this reference in here talks about the vastness of the universe. You've heard me say over and over, I know exactly one quote from Maizumi Roshi. One quote. And that is, enlightenment is like space, the sky. It just goes on and on forever in its vastness.